winds of change are blowing through Raider Nation. And Silver and Black Today keeps you up to date with the latest news and views about your Las Vegas Raiders. Touchdown, Las Vegas! With insight, opinions, and interviews, we're on the cutting edge of what's happening now. Now, now, with the latest on your Raiders and the NFL, your host, Scott Goldbranson and Mo Moten. All right, it's that time again. Welcome back to Silver and Black Today, an Odyssey Sports original podcast covering your Las Vegas Raiders. Scott Colbranson, along with my co-host, Mo Moten. We're here to talk Raiders football with you for the next little bit. And today we're going back into some of our draft preview. Of course, the Raiders need a quarterback. Have we been talking about it? Ah, just a little bit. We'll talk about it some more as the weeks go on. But today, another important position of need is under the microscope with Mo and I today, and that is offensive line. We're going to take a look at this deep class on the draft side, uh, offensive tackle at offensive guard. And we're going to talk about some of those guys uh, as uh, we get you guys set for the NFL draft. Exciting times for the Raiders coming up towards the end of the month. Again, my co-host Mo Motenbrink comes in now. Mo is the senior NFL writer at Bleacher Report. You can follow him on Twitter, X, at Mo Moten, M-O-E-M-O-T-O-N. He's also the Raiders columnist at SportsNot.com, where you can also catch my work, both video and written form. Mo, here we go, man. I know it's off season, so we don't do as many shows, and news is different, right? But we're, we have so much to talk about when it comes to uh, the draft, what the Raiders may do, what needs they have, how they can address those needs. And uh, we're going to do that. We also have, of course, our Raider Nation mailbag in segment two today. And we'll have some phone calls there. And uh, they might have something to do with the draft, too. So we're going to get into this. But, man, uh, of course, you're covering the draft extensively for Bleacher Report and for Sports Not. Um, It's an exciting time of the year. We run up and and you get to the point about two weeks from now, we're all going to get tired of talking about what they're going to do. And instead, we're going to want to know what are they going to do for (laughs) sure. And we won't know until that day. Scott, I'm already there. I don't know if it's a known <laughs> fact that I I'm I don't love mock draft season. Mm-hmm. I enjoy the the draft talk, but four weeks of of just mock drafts to me it is just it's exhausting. It is. It's exhausting because it, you know it's fun to have these educated guesses and opinions, but when you have like like a 50, 100 mock drafts coming out a day, it's like, all right, all right, I'm, I'm ready for the real <laughs> deal. I'm tired of all these simulations. <laughs> yes, yes. And we actually did one, or we're doing one today, I should say, later on our Sports Not show, The Not Zone. It's an NFL-wide show. And Ryan Dyrud and I, we're just going to do the first 15 picks of the first round. Like, we're, we're, we don't want to, oh, we're doing seven. Okay, now we're in round five. Pick number 297. <laughs> no, like, hey, I respect people who do that because that's part of their role. You guys have some great folks over at Bleach Report who do it, and it's awesome. That's what they live for. They're draft analysts. They do that kind of stuff. Most, I mean, listen, most fans, people who watch and listen to our show, they're not, I mean, yeah, they want to know who the Raiders select, but they're not going out and finding out who the 12th best safety is, right? They're not, they're not <laughs> doing that. Uh, for those of you that do, awesome. I mean, everybody's got their hobbies and their interests, so that's cool. But that's why we don't really do mocks here. We'll we'll mock what we think the Raiders will do, but we're not going to do full mock, go through the whole thing and all that kind of stuff. But, yes, it's uh, it gets tiresome because you get sick of waiting, too. I mean, that's what I hear from Raider Nation out there, Mo, and I'm sure you do, too, in social media, which is like, oh, man, you guys keep talking about this, but who cares? They're going to do what they're going to do. And, actually, you're right. But we also want to kind of at least be educated enough so when the Raiders do what they do, we're either going to be kind of in the vicinity of what we, th- we thought they were going to do, or they're going to completely blow us out of the water. What, what I try to do is leading up to the draft is not so much tell you what they're going to do, but what could happen. Because obviously we don't know what they're going to do. We're not, in the, we're not in the draft room. We're not putting together their big board. But what I – and I'll talk about this at the end of the show is – Tom Telesco has a long history as a GM. He's 11 years. So there are some tendencies, there are some habits, there are some patterns there. And I did write an article on sports night, which I will tell later in the show, about <laughs> his tendencies and habits that while it's not predictive totally 100% of what he will do in April, there are some things that he likes to do during the draft. And we'll talk about, I'll talk about that later. 
Yeah, so you get clues, like there's some breadcrumbs, right? We, we don't know the full answer. And so it's interesting, you know, people like to talk about it. They, it's just like they talk about, I don't know, movies, TV shows, the stock market. You know, you, you're always trying to guess. And, and, and if you have a high interest in it, that makes sense. So we want to do a little bit of that, right, and talk about it because I do it. And even, you know, it's funny, you, you make statements or I have opinions. We all have opinions. Doesn't mean you agree with them. Doesn't mean they're right. But we, we share opinions, and I always love sharing opinions in social media because people take it as though you're saying, this is going to happen. Well, how do you know? I don't know. I'm just guessing like everybody else. And so we're <laughs> going to do that today, too, with the offensive linemen. And again, the second segment, we're going to do a little bit of Raider Nation mailbag. The mailbag's slow a little bit this week. You know, people are, people are busy. It's spring. We just had Easter and other holidays, and people are, are kind of, you know, I think – just waiting. They're just, they just want to get, I think the week before the draft, some, some of the more, I would say casual fans. And I say casual fans in that they're not into drafting. They're not into every day looking at what's happening in the NFL. I think they start to check in and like the week before the draft, they're like, okay, it's coming next weekend. Let's get ready. Let me read up on what's going on with the Raiders. So we'll do that. But Mo, we want to start today and we want to talk about offensive line, because again, we talk about quarterback all the time. Everybody's fixated it's the most important position in the game and it's also their golden boys so everybody talks about quarterbacks all the time we're going to talk about the, the 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 beasts in in the interior of the offensive line and on the outside of the line raiders need help on the offensive line it's not that the raiders even though some of you i think incorrectly excuse me for judging think the raiders offensive line was bad last year it wasn't it wasn't the best offensive line, but it also had it also had its issues. And so when you look at what they need to do here, Mo, they need to find, they got to take care of the right side here. We still don't know. It's in flux, right? With Illuminor gone now and some other players, yes, you have Theo Mumford, you have some players who can play there, but are they your bona fide starter? Do you need to bring in a young player to compete? Do you need to sign a free agent to create some depth? And the way I look at it, Mo, let's just start off at that assessment. The Raiders not only need, I think, a bona fide starter on the right side at either guard or tackle, depending what they do with the talent they have, but they also need depth. You have to have depth in the NFL. And uh, if you look at that piece, uh, the Raiders have an opportunity to make up some of that in the draft. There's also so, still some free agent moves they can make. But when you assess this offensive line, give me the, the 50,000 foot level for you on the Raiders offensive line and their greatest need there. To me, the greatest need is right tackle. Um, a lot of Raider Nation has, has talked about the Raiders were to draft Michael Penix, his blind side becomes the right side. I've said that regardless of you draft Penix or a right-handed quarterback, right tackle is still a premium position, regardless, because you want two uh, high-level tackles, ideally, because mm -hmm. if Colton Miller goes down like he did last season, then you're working with fill-ins and, and backups, and Thayer Mumford did a solid job. And I will say this, and I'm going to upset Thayer Mumford supporters out there. <laughs> Thayer Mumford is not a bona fide starter because there, there are some people I've talked to on the X that said, you know, we don't need a right tackle. The Raiders don't need a right tackle. We have Thayer Mumford. And I said, well, while Thayer Mumford was solid in his fill-in duty, he is not – He, I'm not handing him the job. He hasn't done enough for me to say we that the Raiders should pass on a right tackle. Right. And I don't think the Raiders will pass on the right tackle because if you heard Tom Tusco talk to JT DeBrick on Raider Nation Radio 920 AM, he said there he called Thayer Mumford a really interesting player, whether at tackle or guard. And what that tells me is there's a possibility he could move inside at guard. And he doesn't really see – he didn't say that Thayer Mumford is going to be our – he's not going to give out his plan, but he didn't really talk about Thayer Mumford as being the starter at right tackle. Now, he may compete for the starting job. Mm -hmm. But based on what Tom Tusco said, I, I think they're going to try out Thayer Mumford at guard and tackle and see if um, maybe he's a better guard than a tackle. They'll find out. But I fully expect the Raiders to draft a right tackle because I think that's the biggest need on that offensive line. They also need a, a right guard. I talked about this on last week's show that if the season were to start today, which it doesn't, DJ Fluker would be the starting right guard, and he hasn't played a football game in three years. <laughs> There's no way DJ Fluker is going to start at right guard week one of the, of the of the season. I would be thoroughly surprised if he does. So I expect the right tackle, a new right tackle, and a new right guard. And I expect the Raiders to draft at least two offensive linemen in the draft. There you go. And so that's where we want to start. And and it's 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 vital that they do that because whoever, even if 
And I still think they're going to do their their damnedest to get a quarterback in this draft in the first two rounds. If if there's good quarterbacks available in the second round, they might have to spend their first round pick on one. If they do, then it's it's of utmost important. But not only that, it's it's just the bottom line. Even if it's Gardner Minshew or Aiden O'Connell at quarterback in the 2024 season, you still need to upgrade that offensive line. You have a you're going to have a different tandem of running backs with Zamir White and whoever Amir Abdul is there, but they're going to go out and actually get I think another another young running back. But they whatever they do, they're going to need to improve the play up there. The offensive line was good last year, it wasn't a problem, but you can never be too good on the offensive line. You have to be able to build it. And the same goes for the defensive line. We'll address that in a different show. But I want to throw up now. Um, I, I don't. I want to throw up now. But no, I want to. I want to put up. I want to put up the class of. I'm gonna put. A, I take our overlay off here, and I'm gonna put up the class uh, this this year. If you look at the top offensive linemen in the draft, now some some of the order might be different depending on where you read your stuff or where you get it. And Mo, your ranking might be different than the one here. But you look at tackle, right? We'll start with tackle on the left side here if you're watching us on YouTube. Thank you, by the way. Make sure you subscribe. Hit the notifications bell and the thumbs up for us. If you're listening to us, make sure you subscribe to the podcast wherever you get your audio. Okay, offensive tackle. So you start out, some of the names here I want to go through. Joe Alt, which most people, I think, consensus agree that he's probably going to be and should be a top 10 pick. But crazier things have happened, depending on what happens with trades at the top of the draft with the quarterback runs, with some of the wide receivers in this draft, you just don't know. But you have Joe Alt there, Talese Fuaga from Oregon State, and then uh, Troy Fontan, uh, here we go, with all the Pacific Islander Fontano. names. Go, what did you say, Mo? Fontano, yeah. Fontano. Fontano. <laughs> Fontano from Washington. I grew up in San Diego. I should know how to say these names. Um, <laughs> uh, Fashadu at Penn State. You have J.C. Latham in Al Alabama. Amarius Mims at Georgia. And Grant Barton at Duke, who played tackle, but most people, I kept him on the tackle side, Mo, but most people believe that Graham Barton's going to be a guard in the NFL, but he did play mostly tackle at Duke. So you look at this list and, 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 and you say to yourself, okay, um, you know, when you look at where the, the, the Raiders are positioned in the draft, uh, if you think about it, okay, well, at number 13, right? So, so if the Raiders were to not go for a quarterback, with their first pick and they stay put at 13 to me i think you look at uh, fuaga uh, oh my god fuaga fuaga <laughs> fuaga you know what's funny it's really quick today. scott yes. i was on my bleach report live and i was saying to lisi fuaga and someone in the chat saying i was pronouncing it wrong so if you're in the chat if i'm pronouncing fuaga the wrong way let me know, you know i think fuaga. i thought it was fuaga yeah fuaga. i hear people I, I hear people uh emphasize the food but yeah. I just think I, I think there's sometimes there's too much emphasis on the food. I think it's just Fuaga. Yes, yes. And see, so I went a lot of I went to uh, high school with a lot of Samoans in San Diego. So I should know these names. I just haven't used it in a while, so my brain is old and deteriorating with the with the Pacific Islander names. So so yeah. So you look at this list, Mo, and and I think look, I don't think Joe Alt's there at 13. If the Raiders wanted to go offensive tackle, now crazier things that happen. I mean, you have Tennessee, who I think could take him above the Raiders or a, a bunch of teams could take them before the Raiders. But when you look at this list, the other thing to think here too is, is scheme, which obviously with guards is a little more important, but if you look at offensive tackle here, um, I think, I think any one of those guys would be fine down to Latham. I mean, and Mims and Barton good. Like I said, though, Barton, I think moves to guard Mims is a good player too. But when you look at this list, if you're the Raiders at 13 Mo and you go offensive tackle, who's your guy? My guy is Talisi Fuaga. Mm -hmm. Fuaga out of mm -hmm. Oregon State. I, I I picked him in my I had a simulation mock draft on Bleacher Report Live last week. He was my he was the 13th pick. There were some simulations where he was off the board within the top 10. And I think he yeah. could be a top 10 pick because it, I think there's a possibility if you look at Fuaga, he could be, you know, the best right tackle on the board. Now there are some guys that can play both sides. There are some guys who who are, who are only going to play on one side. Fortunately for the Raiders, if they choose Fuaga, they have a need at right tackle, as I just talked about, because I don't think mm -hmm. Dan Mumford is the guy. You could just plug in Fuaga into that spot, and he could start from day one. Now, there are some people out there who think Fuaga would move inside. I don't, I'm don't. i not one of those people. For me, my, philosoph my philosophy is, and I understand it, that usually the best offensive lineman plays left tackle on the collegiate level. But to me, if a guy has played well in the collegiate level at a certain position, my philosophy is, 
have that guy play that position on the NFL level before you move him. Right. Some people just want to automatically move him just based on his measurements, his arm length, a bunch of a bunch of criterion. I say let the guy fail first, and then you think about changing his position before you move him from what he played or last played on the collegiate level. And I think Fuaga is my ideal choice at 13 because I still strongly believe the Raiders go offensive line over cornerback with their first pick. Yes. If it's not a quarterback, I agree with you hundred percent. I, I think that I think Fuaga is the best choice there for them. I think he's a good fit. I think his, his, his makeup too, personality wise, the interviews that I watched over the last couple of days and that there's just the attitude. I just think fits really well with what Antonio Pierce is building not that any of those other guys, there's a couple of those other guys that are that way too, but he's going to be, to me, the best player available at the position when they pick, if things fall the way we think. Again, it could go, he could get taken before the Raiders get there too. There's a possibility because you don't know what happens on draft days. As much as Joe Alt is a guy everybody talks about as the first guy off the board at offensive tackle, somebody might like Fuaga better and they might go that with direction. So then, well, then you'd be stuck with Joe Alt. Oh, jo oh darn. Um, if, <laughs> but three offensive tackles, the mocks that I've done just for my own kind of education, I only had one of them with alt falling out of the top 10, uh, and he still didn't make it to 13. So, so you look at that situation and the Raiders are going to have, if that's the way they go in the first round, Mo, they're going to have you know, a really good opportunity because of all the quarterback. Cause I think four quarterbacks are going at the top of the draft. I think two wide receivers are going at the top of the draft. And if that happens, then that sets up nicely for the Raiders. Maybe not where they wanted to be from a quarterback perspective because they'd like Jaden Daniels or one of those guys. But uh, I still think, though, that this this tends to be the direction things will go. If, if, if Fuaga was gone there and Alt's gone, let's assume, let's say those two guys are are gone on the draft board on draft day, who else uh, there would be, well, who would be your second choice when you look at this list? My second choice would be Troy Fatano. Mm -hmm. um out of washington i'm sure the stork Raider would love that me saying that because he's <laughs> one of those guys who loves washington go dogs for him but in certain sim in some simulations fuaga wasn't available joe alt was obviously off the board olufashanu was off the board and i'm thinking okay if i still i don't want to force the picking a position right but i said okay let me just choose the best player available and i feel like for the raiders if i'm not going quarterback I went with Troy Fontano out of, out of Washington, but there are also questions. There are even bigger questions about whether he's going to move inside the guard because while he's, I think he's a first round prospect, there were some hiccups in pass protection. Yes. And pe and because of that, pe some people think that he could move inside the guard because, you know, maybe he, he'll have some pass protection issues on the pro level if he had it last year. Now the historic rate, if you're listening, I thought Fontano had a better 2022 season. Than he, than he did in the 2023 season, especially specifically in pass protection. So there are questions of whether he is he a top tackle or is he a top guard. And I will say if he happens to be a guard rather than a tackle on the pro level, so you get a top three, maybe a top three guard in the draft. I still love that pick for the Raiders because they have a need at right guard. Mm -hmm. And uh if he can play right guard and if he can only if he can only play on the left side. Then you move Dylan Parham over to the right side because, again, I think Troy Fatano, if he's not a top tackle, he could be a top guard in this draft. Yeah, see, and I go back, my fallback, I guy, he, he, he seems to have fallen a little bit out of favor, Mo, and that is J.C. Latham from Alabama. Um, I like him. I, I understand some of the negatives when people talk about him and some of the other issues that he's had there, but he, to me, he's, he, he's a guy you just don't find as much. I mean, yes – He's a little bit older. He's had penalties. I think it's one of the issues the NFL looks at, and they think about maybe his uh, discipline there. Uh, and he's got room to improve, no doubt about it. But from from a beast on the on on the line, to me, he's a guy that you know. Depending how things fall, if if the Raiders were to get a guy like J.C. Latham, I wouldn't look at it as a disappointment at all. I, I would look at J.C. Latham as a disappointment. I think there are two things here with the J.C. Latham thing because I have seen a lot of J.C. Latham commentary and it's not favorable. Right. Um, one, I think there's some fatigue within Raider Nation because the Raiders picked Alex Leatherwood and it didn't work out, and he's from Alabama. There's a lot of helmet scouting going on, so it's like, oh, it didn't work out with Alex Leatherwood. I don't want to see another Alabama tackle. Now, there are some other Alabama tackles that have struggled, and a lot of people think, oh, it's the system that makes those guys great. Once they get to the NFL, they're not as good. 
And again, I think JC Latham, as, you know, as a zone blocker, I think he would be a pretty good fit for the Raiders, in my opinion. And I think he's a top tackle in this draft as well. So I wouldn't be too sour on JC Latham. And again, I, I think there's some Alabama fatigue with the tackles coming out that they're not as good on the pro level as they are on the collegiate level. But I will say, don't overlook JC Latham. I think he is a fit for the Raiders. Yeah. And I, th- I, I say, I, would I take him at 13 with those other guys available? Uh, probably not, unless you were fully in love with him. But but I think that he's mm-hmm. that talent. I mean, you go back to when the college season started and all the, the mock, not mock drafts, but the draft lists start coming out. He was one, two, three in a, most of them. So it, it shows you how much he's fallen down with some of that. Not only the, the mood within Raider Nation, but also some of the national writers and whatnot, for whatever reason. And Alabama had a strange year in some ways. It came on strong at the end. But the guy has all the physical abilities. A couple other guys, too, that I want to get your opinion on, Mo, um, that I found in watching a lot of film over the last you know four or five days had, are, are guys that, that I think are still top 10, top 15 offensive tackles in this draft, guys that you might be able to get. Let's say you did go quarterback in the first round and uh, you're looking at maybe trading up in the second round or staying where you're at. Some players that could be available. Tyler Guyton from Oklahoma is another guy. He's a little bit raw. He needs a little bit of work. But, man, that kid, the athletic ability. And then Jordan Morgan from Arizona is another guy that I look to. He's he's But he's one of those guys that you talked about earlier, Mo, where some people are like, well, he could play guard in the NFL, but he's played tackle mostly. And to your point, I wouldn't move him. He would be a guy that, yes, you're taking him in the second round. Could he come in and start? Maybe. Would you? Would he have growing pains? Yes. But I look at those two guys, too, and I just think about, boy, now you're getting 10, 11, 12 deep at tackle, and you're still getting talent off, off, the, uh, off the college ranks there. For, for me, I talked about Tyler Guyton early out of Oklahoma, and I said mm-hmm. he would be a great fit for the Raiders. I remember – he had a pretty good senior bowl. Didn't finish out, I think, the whole senior bowl week. But from what he from what he showed, he was pretty good. He had to show that he can you know, hold his anchor uh, against bigger defenders, and he did that. And that was the one check mark because he's he's lean. Even though he's tall, he's kind of lean. Yeah, he can add probably more weight to his frame once he gets into an NFL locker room. I'm not re- really worried about guys putting on strength or weight, adding strength or weight. But I, I think Tyler Guyton is the guy. If the Raiders are going to trade back. I think he would be a, a pretty good fit there because I don't think he's going in the top 15. No. I think guys like Fuaga, I think guys like obviously Fashano and all, I think I even think Fatano will go before him. But Tyler Guyton, I think as far as his athletic profile, fits what the Rays want to do with his own blocking scheme. Yeah, and, and I think that Morgan from Arizona too, again, he's got – I was blown away because, you know, you watch offensive – and I know for those of you who don't watch a lot of football film – you or highlights uh, scouting videos it, it's hard to see but hands so handwork right and the speed of his hands and how he gets out for his block jordan morgan arizona impressed me raw still his, his footwork eh, but still he's so talented that that's why he's at the top of that list at least in the top 10 or 12 depending which list you look at and he's another guy but I think he's a little more developmental. <laughs> but again, there's so much raw talent with some of these guys, Mo, that they, they're even in the top 15 because you an offensive coach or a scout from an NFL team, unlike us as fans or uh, uh, um, observers, they look at a guy like that and somebody might say, oh, he's not that good. But they look at it and say, holy crap, I can't teach that. I can't teach that. I can teach that and that. If I draft him and bring him in, we can turn him around quickly. Speaking of traits, and Amaris Mims is probably the most interesting yes. prospect here because he has he I think he's the least experienced of the top guys we're gonna talk about. I believe yeah. he has like less than ten, he has fewer than ten starts, maybe eight starts. Right. Had an injury also, I believe. But he's the guy where he's like, you know, he's I believe six, seven, three forty. Three forty. And he's just and he's just a mold of clay where he's so <laughs> raw, so green that you can't teach certain things, but if you develop him, he could be a complete monster on the offensive line. I think a lot of a lot of teams are going to be intrigued by him coming out of Georgia because of the fact that while he doesn't have the experience, he has the things, as you said, that you can't teach. Yeah, and that that to me, I mean, you look at him and and you're just like, wow, this is this is a massive human being, um, <laughs> but you don't see. The offensive linemen of that size with that athletic ability, Mo, they only come around once in a while. I mean, it's not like you see guys like this every single year. So 
I, I, let me ask you this question. This will be a little more of a provocative question. Um, and that is, and I actually had somebody ask me this, they DM me on X about it. Could you see if the Raiders can't get the quarterback that they want, first round, second round, whatever it is, let's say they go offensive line in first round. They don't have, the, and maybe they're waiting for Penix or Knicks, whoever it is. And he's gone by their pick in the second round. They're unable to trade up, or if they trade up a little bit, the quarterback's gone. Um, could you see the Raiders going tackle guard? Now we're going to get to the guards in a second. I, I could see him do it. I, I could see them definitely do it. And it would drive Raider Nation nuts <laughs> because Raider Nation wants their quarterback. They yes. want a young quarterback pretty early. I'm seeing the draft. You have to draft Michael Penix at 13 takes now. Yeah. But I could see the Raiders going tackle guard. I, mm -hmm. I, I'm going to reference my sports, not, uh, my sports not piece again that when the Chargers have had holes on their offensive line, Tom Telesco has been very aggressive at filling needs along the mm -hmm. offensive line. One year he drafted guards in back to back rounds. I wasn't first and second round, I was second, third round in 2017. Uh, the two, I believe, two of the last three years he's drafted an offensive lineman in the first round, Rashawn Slater, Zion Johnson, tackle guard. Uh, not in the same draft, but I could definitely see that happening. I, I wouldn't do that because I want Michael Penix for the Raiders, and he's probably not going to be there in the third round. Mm -hmm. but I could definitely see that happening if they don't love Michael Penix, Bo Nix, or any of the second-tier quarterbacks. Yeah, I mean, and it could be their emergency plan. It wouldn't be a bad emergency plan, by the way, because if you take care of guard and tackle in the same draft with two players that are top 10 players at their position, and maybe even top five when you get to the guard position, great. So, I mean, that's what you do. You got to build the trenches. It's so very important. But, yes, you do need the quarterback, too. So, all right, we're going to take our first break. When we come back, we're going to do the guards. It'll be a shorter conversation. There's there's a lot of guards that are in the draft. They're all good ones. And then the final uh, segment, we're doing three today. I said two earlier. We're doing three. Uh, when we get back from that, we will do our Raider Nation mailbag. Uh, guards are coming up next. The big boys on the inside with Mo and Scott here on Silver and Black today. Welcome back. Silver and Black today, the Thursday edition. Appreciate you guys being with us. Do us a favor. If you don't already subscribe to the show on the audio side, do so, please. Wherever you get your audio, wherever you listen to your podcast. Please subscribe, Silver and Black, today. Also, if you haven't listened to it on the audio side in a while, Apple changed their rules. You got to go in and, and not resubscribe, but you just got to play an episode for a bit uh, or they'll start taking you out. They're trying to help clean out your phone for stuff you don't listen to anymore, which is good because I sometimes subscribe to stuff and it's like, what? I don't listen to that anymore. Anyway, but if you do that, great. If you're watching us on YouTube, thank you. And the chat is always lively. You guys are great. So thank you for being there. Hit the subscription button the notifications bell and a thumbs up. We would appreciate that. All right, we're going to get into the guards now on the offensive side. I am Scott Branson, of course, jo joined by Mo Moten, my co-host here on Silver and Black today. All right, Mo, let's look now if we get to um, the guards. Uh, we look at offensive guards and the list I have here, Cooper Beebe from Kansas State, Christian Haynes, Christian Mahogany, Zach Zinter, what a name. ZZ, baby. Uh, Trevor Keegan, Javion Cohen, and Layden Robinson. Um, you look at this list, too, and, you know, pretty impressive, I think, especially one through five. And and even the rest of this list, too, is, is great. But when you look at the Raiders, now, we do not know for sure, Mo, exactly what Luke Getze's plans are. But, like you said, with... Tom Telesco being a GM, we know Luke Getze was the offensive coordinator for the Bears, and we know that he ran his own blocking scheme. Uh, so we can make some assumptions from that, right? Uh, and you look at these players, and I think it, when you talk about guards, it matters significantly. When you look at this list and you think about what could be Luke Getze's offense in Las Vegas, who sticks out at you? Who's your number one choice here if you're the Raiders and you're going guard in the second or third round, uh, wherever it falls? Definitely going to be Christian Haynes out of UConn. Now, UConn mm -hmm. is not known as a powerhouse school that's sending out a lot of NFL talent, but I will say I think Christian Haynes is the best scheme fit. Scheme, exactly. Uh, with the, the system that he played in, in UConn kind of closely resembles what uh, Kyle Shanahan runs in San Francisco. And as I said, the Raiders hired the San Francisco 49ers former offensive line coach, former assistant offensive line coach, and James Craig. So mm -hmm. just keep that in mind. James Craig is now the Raiders offensive line coach, was under Kyle Shanahan. Christian Haynes, who played at UConn, 
system similar to what they run in San Francisco, which is why I think Christian Haynes is the ideal pick there. Now, he's a bit on the, I guess you would say, the short side, about 6'2". But mm-hmm. I, I think he fits the profile of what the Raiders need in Luke Getz's system, and he could be a day one starter coming out of UConn. While a lot of people, again, are not looking to UConn for NFL players, Christian Haynes should be the guy. Second round pick. Yeah, in the second round, I think I think that's two as well. Um, and to me, you look at 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 um, at what he's able to do. To your point, and I think this is where it's it's hard unless you do unless you cover the sport significantly or you're just a pure football head. Um, the the scheme issue here, you could see a guy, you might see somebody go on Mel Kiper Jr., whoever you listen to and like about the draft, talk about Cooper Beebe or talk about. Zach Zinter out of Michigan. Of course, Trevor Keegan, both those guys were great with Michigan in their national championship run. Um, but you look at them and you might see how great they are. But if they don't, if they're not, if they're not in a zone scheme, like you said, like a San Francisco, like you, Luke Getze runs, then they might not be the best fit. They might be great athletes, but it's, it's you know, to ask them to do what you need them to do. It might not be exactly in their wheelhouse. So you look at that and you look at scheme and you look at the lists and just understand if you're reading out there, just just a tip, if you're reading out there, make sure that you look at those draft reports and find the best offensive guards for zone blocking scheme, um, because some of them might not be as as good of a fit because of that. Um, who else sticks out at you, Mo? The other player that sticks out, and I didn't initially, um, I didn't initially talk a lot about this player, even though he's at the top of. Arliss, Cooper Beebe. Uh, I think Cooper Beebe, I looked at his measurements and how he tested at the combine, and I compared it to some of the guards that Tom Tesco has drafted in the past, i.e. Forrest Lamp, you know, i.e. Dan Feeney. And his profile, physical profile, and the way he tested at the combine closely resemble those two guys in Lamp and Feeney. So I think Cooper Beebe also could be a pick for the Raiders. I actually strongly believe that after initial, after initially kind of overlooking him, not to say he what he's not a you know a second, maybe a top, you know, a top two round prospect, but I, I looking at Cooper BB and looking at his measurements especially, I think he fits the profile of what Tom Telesco would want for his offensive line, assuming that Luke Getzi signs off on it and says, yeah, that could that guy could fit in our system. Yes, and th- and that's it. It's got to be that. So this is where you know when you guys think about um, the NFL and how much impact a coach has on draft picks. Like, because the general manager, the general manager knows football, but he's not a coach most of the time. And so to your point, Luke gets, he's going to be there and he's going to ask, or I'm sorry, Tom Telesco is going to ask Luke, Luke gets Hey, listen, here's these three guys that we really rate highly, which is the best for your system. And he's going to show them. He's going to say, Hey, look, these two guys fit the system. They know how to, they know the zone blocking scheme really well. They fit it well. Here's why we like them. And then Tom Telesco will make the best pick that he can. So, so yeah, I, I BB, it, what a player. I mean, you, you look at what he's been able to do um, and, and he's so elite from and on the interior. And that's hard to say because people don't watch the interior linemen when you're watching the game, right? Unless you watch film, it's not evident right away, but he's very dominant. And you say, well, this guy, if you're on the West coast, you're saying Kansas state, I don't ever watch Kansas state. But, but he's an amazing, amazing player. A couple of guys that I want to bring up to you because I do think those two, to me, uh, are definitely there second round and, and are available. You start to get lower on the list there, Mo. Um, a guy I like, and I think this, this is somebody more third, even maybe fourth round, as crazy as that sounds, uh, maybe won't last that long, but uh, Keaton Bills out of Utah. You ready? 6'5", 321. Okay, smart, quick, just just mind blowing with his athletic ability, and he's he's his own blocker. I mean, he's been in the zone blocking scheme, so he understands the game really, really well. And I think this is a guy. He, I don't know if he fits exactly the Telesco mold, but it's pretty close. I would say, if, again, to reemphasize, zone blocking scheme, gap blocking scheme. Yeah. So man, you know, hat on the hat type of deal is the gap blocking scheme. If you're if you're looking for and, and Scott went with a, a scheme fit here. So again, mm-hmm. we want to emphasize if you're looking for a fit, we we believe that the Raiders are going to have a heavy zone blocking scheme. So there are going to be players that, as you said, are going to be pretty good or top-notch gap blocking guys. Yeah. 
may not be the best fit for the Raiders, but they're going to be they're going to be top top gap blocking guys. Now they're going to be some unknown names that Scott just brought up one <laughs> that are going to be scheme fits that the Raiders may look at in the third or fourth round. So some people may scratch their head and go, "Who you know? Who's this guy from you know from Utah? Who's this guy from North Dakota <laughs> State? You know who's Mason McCormick? I like Mason McCormick, by the way." And he's probably my my sleeper guard. Now he played a lot of left guard, and we'll see if the Rays do with Dylan Parra. But just like you, I have some names that I'm looking at specifically because they're having the zone blocking scheme and they fit Luke Getz's system. If the Raiders were the draft, yeah, and I mean, there, there's guys too. Like I I always try to go to second tier. Now the first tier guys, you're going to hear all about them, right? So Bills is a guy, and you know, you look at most lists, he's top ten from a guard perspective. Um, but then you have Matthew Jones from Ohio State, like who's a little bit really good in the run, not as good in the past. So you start to see as you get past number 10, you start to see guys that are going to be much more of, I, I wouldn't call them projects, but they're going to need development. So you start to get in the fourth round-ish, maybe even bottom of the third round, depending where they go, you start to see guys that you can't necessarily count to come in. Now, things can happen, but that can't come in and maybe start right away, but are still good draft picks. So if you see the Raiders take a fourth-round guard after they've already taken a guard in the second round, don't be surprised because they might be a great talent, and you need depth there anyway, so you go that direction. So a guy like Jones, who needs to work on his pass protection, okay, well, if he's sitting on the bench and he's a developmental player and you get him in the fourth round, okay, great. I don't think he'll last in the fourth round, but if he was – then you get the opportunity there to build depth. So that's the other thing here is the tiers, not only the scheme fit, which you did a great job of explaining to everybody out there, Mo, but also the idea that when you take some of these guys, yes, if you're taking them in the second round, you certainly want them to hopefully come in and start right away. But when you get past the second round, not that there isn't third rounders who start in the NFL, but you start to think differently about that player's path to becoming a contributor. And I think about zone blocking is, you don't necessarily want a mauler because everyone thinks, okay, you draft a guard, he's got to be 330 and be right. able to, he's got to be a people mover. And, you know, all, all the cliches you kind of hear about big body guards with the zone blocking scheme, you want more athletic offensive linemen who can get to a spot and be pullers and, you know, come out, come out in clear lanes and, you know, block on the backside. You, you want guys who can move. So, when you're thinking about guards, potential guards for the Raiders, just keep that in mind that you don't necessarily want the 330-pound guard. <laughs> you may want the 315-pound guard who's a better athlete, who's a better athlete and can move a lot more. And I talked about Mason McCormick out of South Dakota State. Yeah. I want to talk about him again because he actually fits measurements wise. He's about 6'4, 3, 309, 310. He's another guy that if you look at his profile, matches closely with who Tom Telesco has drafted in the past and for a mm -hmm. slam to Dan Feeney from his uh, height and weight to his athletic score. And now he's one of the most athletic guards in this draft oh, yeah. class. And but because but because he's coming out of South Dakota State, people are going to overlook him and say, well, can he compete on the pro level after that jump from South Dakota State? We'll see what Tom Telesco thinks. But as far as the zone blocking guards, just keep in mind, you don't necessarily want the 330-pound mauler. It's more of the athletic guard who can move out in space. Right. I mean, there's guys like – there's a guy at Tulane uh, uh, first, but Prince Pines, Prince Pines. Prince Pines, great example of a guy, big, 6'4", 320, three, something like that. But he's a, he's a, he's a man-blocking guy. Like, he's a guy – if you're a man-blocking scheme, great. That's the guy you pick later in the draft. But I'm going to give you, before we move on, Mo, uh, and, and close up uh, on guards, what, my, 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 my dark horse, whatever you want to call him, C.J. Hansen from Holy Cross. I don't know if you, you're familiar with him, but 6'5", yes. 300, work in progress. This is the guy where he's, do, he's a development. He's, you're not going to pick him in the first three or four rounds, maybe fourth round. But this guy is a fucking beast. He just does he's like he's like that 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 kid growing into his body and he doesn't quite know what to do with it yet, but you can see the flashes. I I, I love the pick because I talked I think I talked about CJ Hansen more than any other person on the Bleach Report Airways oh, last week. Nice. Yes, because I draft in the simulation, I actually drafted him in the sixth round. Six I, round. I believe the Raiders have multiple six round picks or mm -hmm. and multiple seventh round picks or one of the two. They have multiple of one of those uh, picks in those two rounds, and you can get C.J. Hansen late. And I think because he's coming out of Holy Cross, 
Mm-hmm. People don't know who he is or where Holy Cross is. <laughs> so they, they have no idea who CJ Hansen is. But every every time I've had a chance where people said, who is the sleeper guy or who is a day three guy that you would pound the table for, I try to mention CJ Hansen every chance I get. So I had a big Kool-Aid smile when you said CJ Hansen. I, my eyes immediately lit up and know that we're on the same page. Pretty, pretty cool to know. By the way, quick note. So Matthew Jones, I mentioned from Ohio State, he's from your neck of the woods. He's a Brooklyn kid. So there, there are quite a few. I will say there are quite a few New York City draftees in this class. And I will be shouting them out during, during the draft. There's a, I forgot what position he plays, but there's a guy also from Harlem that some people in my neck of the woods know very well. Uh, there's a guy from the Bronx in this draft class as well. So it's good to see New York City get on the map because we're we're mostly known for, for hoops and basketball. Yes. It's good to see some of the football guys get some notoriety. Yeah, he went to Hall High School in Flatbush. So there you go. See? Okay. Eras- I think that's Erasmus Hall. Erasmus Hall. That's right. You got it. So, yeah. And it's too bad that those New York kids, the good players in New York, they don't have any schools out there that are good in football, really. I mean, yeah, Rutgers every once in a while, but even then. So, but yes, we don't really claim Rutgers, even though it's because it's in New Jersey, <laughs> but we'll, we'll take Across it the river. it's, yeah, it's, a, it's New Jersey, New York. But when it comes to the five boroughs, which is where I'm at, where I'm, where I'm at. Yeah. Erasmus Hall is like the school, uh, to, to look at for, for football talent. Football. Oh, yeah. uh, there, there have been quite a few guys, Curtis Samuel, wide yes. receiver. Uh, he's from Erasmus Hall. So yeah. he's probably the most known prospect, uh, no, most known player, but we got some footballers in the, in the five bars. We're not all hoops in basketball. We're not all. Yeah, but stuff. you go back Hall High School. You ready? The the the, the amazing Sid Luckman from 1939 to 1950. There you go. The amazing Chicago Bears quarterback. There you go. There you go. I didn't know he went there. So there you go. Who else we got? That's current. A lot of guys back in the day. <laughs> and then it was like, like a, so. there's a dry spell for 30 years until Sean Lee, who I know because he played for the Chargers. He was a nose tackle and played defensive end a little bit. Played for 10 years in the NFL. Then Curtis Samuel and Christian Ising, Tampa Bay, the safety, who was there uh, last year. So there you go. You learned something about Mo's hometown. There you go. <laughs> Bingo. All right. Well, Mo, anything else on the guards you want to make a point about before we uh, take a break and then get to the phone calls? Yeah, Zach Zinter. Uh, I've, mm. I've seen Zach Zinter in a lot of mock drafts. I don't think Zach... Not to say Zach Zinter can't be good in his own in his own blocking scheme, but I look at his athletic profile, and he's not typically what Tom Telesco would go after. Tom, right. Again, Tom in doing my research in Tom Telesco with his guards, he likes athletic guards. If you look at a lot of the guards or interior offensive linemen that Tom yeah. Telesco has drafted, he likes usually these are guys guards that rank at the top of the class in in their athletic scores. So if, you look, yeah. if you're into the Ross scores. Uh, those athletic scores, then pay attention to those scores because that's what Tom Telesco is looking at. And, and usually Tom Telesco's guards are about 6'3", six, 6'4", six, between a little over 300 pounds, maybe up to 315 pounds. So again, if you're looking at a guard that's about 330 or a guard that's a slow mover, slow footed, probably not a fit for the Raiders. Yeah, I mean, I think I think actually, and, and he's still not the best fit, but his teammate Keegan, I think, would be more in the mold of a Telesco pick. Although I still think he's not quite um, what what Telesco has been go- known to go for. So, all right. Well, there you go. We got you up to speed on offensive linemen as we roll through prior to the NFL draft here on Silver and Black today. We're going to take our final break. When we come back, we're getting to your phone calls on the Raider Nation mailbag. Stay right there. Raider Nation is never shy. You ask, we answer. It's time for the Raider Nation mailbag. What's on your mind, fam? Drop us an email at mail at silverandblacktoday.com. That's mail at silverandblacktoday.com. Now, it's your time to speak up. All right, it's that time of the week. You guys are a little shy this week. I notice I notice when there's when there's less going on, you you you, you want to talk to us less. That's to be expected, right? <laughs> oh, so yeah. So we get um, a couple phone calls this week, and I'm looking, I'm trying to find to make sure I didn't miss any of the emails because I think we had a couple emails. Uh, let me find. Oh, here it is. I got, I got one. Okay. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna start. I'm gonna start with the email, 
and I wish I could give this person's name out, but what? He's got a weird email address. It's Cody Zolkajuga. It's all like, whatever. I, you would think that it was like a, a spam email address. So my Just friend, Cody. what's that? Call him Cody. I'll call him Kotaizo. Kotaizo. Okay, Kotaizo. Yeah. So I was phonetically spelling to come up with a good one. Okay, Kotaizo. <laughs> he says, hello, Scott Mo. This is Raider Kojo. Oh, see, it was in the, I had to do is read the email. It's Raider Kojo. All right. There we go. All right, Raider Kojo. Thank you. Kojo. Yes. Raider I'm Kojo. always interested, by the way, Raider Kojo, and this is not this is not a negative at all. I don't want you to take it this way. I'm always interested, though, in people, and I kind of respect it. A lot of people who are sports fans who go by a moniker and you don't know their real identity because they want to interact and they like to keep their privacy. It's so hard to keep any privacy today, right? You can't keep any privacy whatsoever. And um, so when people do this, like I used to kind of be like, why do you do a, I'm Raider this or I'm Raider that? And then I was like, oh, you know what? I get that. I think that's kind of cool. And then they get they get a persona about them, right? Scott, like Stoic my Raider. real, like Stoic Raider, right? I don't know Stoic Raider's real name. Mm. I just know him as Stoic Raider. Yeah. Uh, I, I would assume John, John, my guy, John, John, 585. 585. His first name is John Jonathan. But people for people for the longest time thought my first name was actually Mo M O E. Yeah, like there are some people out there who don't know my first name. I won't say it on the air today. I can, I'm sure you can guess it because it's out there on my on my articles. But people thought that Mo was actually my first real name. My no, everybody knows name. your real first name is Mordecai. <laughs> hey, you know <laughs> that's that's what you think. Roll with it. I like my privacy too. By the way, I of course you do. Yes, as we as our listeners pointed out when I, we were joking last week about <laughs> about you know how I was always trying to set you up on dates before you had a significant other, and uh, you kind of quit back at it. And people were like, "I think does anybody think Mo's really sick of Scott?" <laughs> I was like, "I love it. It's so funny." But I appreciate the comments. They care. They care. You know, I, I'll say anytime that I say something, if it was something <laughs> serious, it would be talked about off air. Off anything air. I say, anything hey. I say on air. Unless it's football, it's not that serious. Either. Well, really and you know what? What's interesting <laughs> about it, and I can relate to it though, and I know we're going to get to 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 Raider Kojo's question here in a second, but I can relate to it too because listen, I don't expect everybody that either watches, listens, at least even if they just watch one time. Some people, you know, you come across when you do shows like this. You have a personality that's not always. Yes, it's partly real us. But also, you don't know what it's like sitting next to me having a beer or whatever. So some people like you and some people don't. For whatever reason, they just like, I don't like his personality. I don't like how he says this or I don't like that opinion. And they make a judgment about you. And that's okay. That's just the way the world works. And some people don't like me. Some people don't like you. More my side than your side for some reason. But hey, you know. Um, but no. Really? But I think, I think, I'm just kidding. But I think that there's some people who just don't like you. And, and some people get upset about that. I don't. Um, and so I'm like, Oh, you don't like it. Cool, man. That's good. You're, you're a big Mo fan. You don't like me. Luckily Mo does his own stuff too. He does Bleacher Report live. So if you don't want to see me at all, you don't have to watch, but it's always funny when people try to create or in their minds, they have some idea that because we were discussing something, <laughs> it goes like that. But anyway, I don't want to waste everybody's time, but it's funny. And, uh, I, I cause I sent, so there's a couple of comments and I just send them to Mo cause Mo doesn't really read the comments for a lot of good reasons. And I, so I sent it to him and, and he's just like, oh, this is funny. So, but thank you for your comments. All right, we're gonna get to the, the email here from Raider Kojo in Sacramento. Uh, and he says, the, the J is not silent. I know. <laughs> Raider Kojo, <laughs> I can speak Spanish? No, Raider Kojo. Uh, and it says, Hey, if I'm the GM of the Raiders, I'm calling the bears and asking what is the uh, price? And then I'm paying it as long as it's not Max Crosby in the deal. So Raider Kojo, Mo, listen, and Raider Kojo, I get it. And I respect being all in bears. Aren't trading the pick man, but if they were Mo would, what would be too much? I mean, five years of number one picks, three years of number one picks. What? I mean, I don't think you can even put a price on it because I don't think it's available. I don't think it's available either, but let's say, let's just play along Raider Kojo and say it is, you know, the Bears are open for business, right? Yeah. Let's say 
let's say Caleb, Caleb Williams doesn't want to go to Chicago, right? Yeah. So the Bears are like, okay, we'll trade the pick. They probably wouldn't trade to the Rays because they probably still want a quarterback and 13 is too far back. Yeah. But uh, let again, let's just go with the scenario and say they trade the pick. What would it cost? I would probably say you start the conversation to three first rounders. Mm -hmm. and, the, and the Bears would probably, and if you're trading with the Raiders, again, who are at 13, the, Ra the Bears are probably not going to get a top tier quarterback. So then they're giving up not only the spot to the Raiders, but they're giving up the opportunity to pick not only Caleb Williams, but Drake May and probably Jalen da Jaden Daniels. Yep. They're probably going to wind up settling for a Bo Nix or a Michael Penix if they go back that far. Yeah. So I, I would think they would want probably Devontae Adams in that spot. Now they also now by the way they have that they also have the ninth pick. Ninth pick. I uh, yeah. will say they they would have pick picks nine and thirteen. So they could probably take if they like Bo Nix or Michael Pence, they could take them at nine. And they could take a wide receiver at, at 13 in the Raiders spot. But I would assume that hey, if we're gonna move back that far, not only do we want future draft capital, we want Devontae Adams. Now, because now they already have Keenan Allen and DJ Moore, but can mm -hmm. you imagine getting a quarterback and having that trio of wide receivers? That trio of wide receivers would elevate whoever the quarterback is, and they could say, "Okay, we'll take Michael Penix because we have this supporting system that will elevate Michael Penix's game because we have Keenan Allen, we have Devontae Adams, we have DJ Moore." Now, before Raider Nation pulls their hair out, I would not do this trade because yeah. I've already said that the Carolina Panthers ran into issues when they traded. DJ Moore to the Bears, and then they drafted Bryce Young, and he honestly had no one to throw to, but Adam Thielen was his best wide receiver. Right. So I would not trade Devontae Adams to any team because I would want Devontae Adams to be there for my young quarterback. Yeah, and the other thing I'll say too is, and I and I and I'm a firm believer because everybody mm -hmm. seems to go like everything else in today's society goes to extremes. So people want to hoard draft picks and never trade them because we need drafts, we got to do it. And then there's people who are like. Draft picks don't work out. Just trade them all and get the best play. Look, it's an in-between thing. It's The reality of that is in the middle there, and that is the Raiders, to move up to get Caleb Williams, if they could, just for the sake of argument, if they could, okay. But if you give away too much, this team, the Raiders team, is getting better. The defense is getting better. The offense needs some work. But you're not, like, right there where everything else is copacetic and you just need that quarterback or you're 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 in a deeper rebuild and you want to get the quarterback because you know it's going to take three years to get there but if you do well if you trade away three number ones look i don't think the raiders are, look i you do whatever you can to get your quarterback but you don't you you have to build you've had so many bad drafts in the last eight years you need to build that team and the only way you're going to build it in the modern nfl with the salary cap is via, via those rookie contracts and you have got to have draft picks. Now, it doesn't mean they all have to be number one picks. I'm not saying that. But any kind of compensation that you're giving away, boy, it's going to take away. Because you know what? This year you get that. Next year you could get maybe it's a better safety class, if I recall. Next year you could get a really great safety in the first round. Or you could get another offensive lineman or a defensive lineman, another edge guy if, if Tyree Wilson doesn't end up working. Like, you, you, you have to build. It's sort of like in baseball. Yeah, you can go out and sign the big free agent, but you got to build your minor leagues, right? Well, the Raiders in football have to build through the draft. The reason they have not been good is because they haven't been able to do that. Right. Can you imagine if the Raiders had hit on more of their top draft picks from 2019 to 2021? How oh, different. They would, you know, they, they'd, they'd be a double-digit win team without, without question if they hit on right. more of those picks. But it didn't happen. So they were stuck in this mediocre zone. And and I think Tom Salesco can help this team out of that uh, rut when it comes to drafting because his draft record is pretty good, specifically in the early rounds. Now, mm -hmm. he didn't give a lot of second contracts to his middle, late round picks, but doesn't mean they weren't good picks. Right. So I, I will say that with the, with the discussion around trading up, for me, it's a pretty much a dead issue unless the Patriots decide they want to move back. Then I think... You know, then the Vikings and the Raiders are teams you look at to, to, to move up. Now, a lot of people are going to say, Mo, we don't want Caleb Williams. Did, did you see him in the stands with his pink phone case and his <laughs> fingernails and all of this other stuff? And I will say, judge the player by what he does on the field. I, I don't care about the other stuff off the field unless he's getting in trouble. Once right. once once he starts getting in trouble, then I start to, to pay attention. But all the other stuff is like, all right, whatever. He He's a different type of personality. We all know, and I, and I said this to you, Scott, 
by a text message because yes scott and i talk every, almost every day just about every day <laughs> that that <laughs> we're, we're we're not we're not enemies offline by the way we do talk every day uh i did say that every generation has a new type of athlete so when you were growing up there's a there was a certain type of profile of what an athlete is or how he acts or how she acts when i was growing up it was a little different yeah. right now now they're more you know business oriented and you know a lot of deals off the field and stuff of that nature and people bristled at that now the generation behind me coming up guys in their 20s young 20s and teens they're a different type of athlete they have different interests they do different things they may paint their fingernails they may love the color <laughs> pink i don't think any of that should influence your football decisions when, when it comes to drafting players yeah, and like 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 I said uh, to to Ryan over at uh, LA Football Network about Caleb Williams because I was asking him a lot of questions about him, and it's 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 might not be my cup of tea, but so what? To your point, yeah. can the guy play? Is the key, and um, yeah, do I think it's odd? Yeah, but I'm 50 years old. I, I'm sure when I was 18 and I got my first earring when I went away to college, people were like. <laughs> There's some 70 year old guy at the grocery store saying, what is this guy, kid? What is this boy wearing an earring for? Right? So look, I'm not here to pass judgment on him and people like him for whatever reason they like him. And they don't like him for reasons like that. But yeah, I agree. And I, I actually think, and I'm, I'm going to make one small prediction here and it's not related to the Raiders, but it is related to the draft. The conversation we're having is I think the only trade that happens at the top of the draft, by the way, is I think the giants move up to four and the Cardinals fall back to six, which might mean, yes, they can't get Marvin Harrison Jr. Because I, I don't think he'd get past the Chargers, but but they could get Malik Neighbors and they need a wide receiver. So I'm thinking I'm thinking that the Giants might actually get to the top four. And I my projection is I, I think that the Giants are either going to get McCarthy or May, depending who the Patriots take, uh, because it sounds like the Patriots are going to take quarterback. It, it sounds like it, it's going to be interesting because the Giants have been connected mostly to J.J. McCarthy. Yes. I will say that there's a scenario I can think of or I can drum up in my head where what if the Giants don't really like Drake May? That the Drake May could be available for the Raiders. Because let's say let, let's let's say fall. that right, let's say that the Vikings really like JJ McCarthy and they mm -hmm. move up ahead of the Giants and take and take JJ McCarthy and the Giants say, Okay, fine, we really like JJ McCarthy, but we're not in love with Drake May. We'll take the top wide receiver, whoever it is, Marvin Anderson Jr., Malik Neighbors, whoever it is. And then Drake May starts to slip. And let's say Drake May is available there at, you know, let's say seven. Yeah. Right? For some the reason, Titans. he's there at seven. Mm -hmm. And you're thinking, and you're the Raiders, and you're like, okay, we can't have Jaden Daniels, but Drake May is available at seven, and we could move up. I, I'll yeah. ask Raider Nation out there listening to me right now, would you be okay if the Raiders were to move up to seven to draft Drake May as their quarterback? Assuming Jay Daniels is off the board, Caleb Williams is off the board, JJ McCarthy is off the board, Drake May is the guy there at seven, and the Raiders call up the Titans, and if a trade was made, the Raiders move up, draft Drake May. What is your reaction to that? I know mine would be elation. I like Drake May. I know he's yeah. kind of fallen back. He's fallen now below Jaden Daniels on the, the and maybe even JJ McCarthy. He might be number four now, uh, but he is he's a stud. I think he's he's going to translate well to the pro game. Uh, so we'll see there, but. Raider Kojo, thanks for your your uh, email. And now we're going to get to our first phone call, and it's our buddy Tarek. Let's find out. Tarek has is always traveling on business, so Somewhere I'm sure he'll tell us. Yeah, you think so? You think he's in the Midwest? It seems to be his territory, doesn't it? Yeah. Okay, That's here we go. Here's Tarek. Chicago. Chicago. Good afternoon, Scott and Mo. This is Tarek checking in with you guys from Davenport, Iowa. Davenport! I hope you guys are well. Back in Iowa. just want to talk a little bit more draft as we get closer to that big weekend. Uh, I do think, as I said previously, the Raiders are going to attempt to move up to get that quarterback. But if not, man, we've got to get it right with the 13th overall pick. We've got to get that blue chip player. Um, nobody has I, – I, has anybody butchered the draft over the recent years that more than the Raiders? Um, I think there's been a lot of front office turnover. Ziegler was a clueless idiot. Mayock was just a clown. Um, I do think that um, the two positions of need other than quarterback are, are cornerback and, off and offensive tackle. When is the last time, other than Namdi Asamoah and Charles Woodson, when is the last time we've had a shutdown cornerback? Um, and, and I agree with what you said uh, previously on the show, Scott, that we have to keep trying, but when I think of offensive tackle, yes, it's not sexy, but it is a position of need. 
But I just, my mind drifts to the Alex Leatherwoods and the Robert Galleries and the John Clays, just so many <laughs> wasted draft picks. Uh, edge rushers, Cleveland Farrell, Tyler Brayton. Uh, I do think that as far as they're full, uh, filling the need at running back, I do think we're going to uh, be able to do that in a later round. Uh, but when is the last time the Raiders have had a thumper at linebacker? Like, is it Matt Mellon? Like, I can't think of a sideline to sideline player who really, you know, can get after the run and the pass, play, play, uh, both positions effectively. Uh, you know, when's the last time we've had that at linebacker? So let me know what you guys think. I do think cornerback and or offensive tackle is going to be the 13th pick if we cannot uh, move up. And I do think that um, we will get a quarterback maybe high in the second round like we did Derek Carr. But we've just got to get it right. We can't continue to be wasting these first-round picks. It's got to be a blue-chip player, and hopefully that that player can contribute right away. Have a great week, guys. Looking forward to your uh, shows this week. Talk to you guys later. Bye-bye. All right, there's Tarek. Always great calls. couple points he's made there. We, we most, should just have a bulletin board. Really quick, Scott. We should yeah. just have a bulletin board of, of where Tarek is. Okay, we'll do a map. I, I got that Let's in my it, notes. I got that in my Let's notes. We're going to do that. Tarek. Whenever we do a Tarek call, we're going to flap up a map. We're going to trace him and tell and see where he's at. All right. So a couple of things. A lot of stuff to unwrap there. So number one is I'm going to start with one of his last points, Mo. Because I think there's a, an answer to this. While he's right, the Raiders have not had a big thumping linebacker. The position has changed. Like, you know, and, and Tarek, I don't know how old you are. I know you're not as old as I am. But I do know that you know, the way the game has changed, the linebacking position is different. You know, the Lawrence Taylor days, the Matt Millen days. Now, you still have good linebackers. Don't get me wrong. Great athletes, of course. Some of the best in the league. But... It's not the same. So evaluating them, I think, yes, the Raiders have not had good linebacking play for quite a while. They did last year, obviously, Spillane surprised uh, and, and whatnot. But but I think that that's part of that, Mo, is the game has changed there. It's it's sort of like running backs. You still need a linebacker, but it's not going to be a position you're taking in the first round. I also think part of Tarek, what he's saying about the linebacker position is the Raiders also haven't had stability there. Yeah, I true. know he said a thumper at linebacker, but I think I don't want to put words in your mouth. But tell me if I'm right about this that you're you're also frustrated with the constant revolving door at the position yeah. where they haven't had a, a long term solution there. Right. And I'll go back to my sports knots piece that Tom Telesco has a history of drafting linebackers fourth round and earlier. So Tarek, if you want a linebacker, a, a long term position player there in that spot, you may get it with Tom Telesco in this year's draft. Not going to make any guarantees, but his track record says it's possible. Yeah. Now, I will say that the last linebacker that the, the Reds had with consistency was a guy that people say I look like is Kirk Morrison. <laughs> Some people say I look like Kirk Morrison. I don't know. I don't see it. But he's probably <laughs> the last linebacker the Reds had for multiple years where he wasn't in and out within one or two seasons. But I do agree with uh, Tarek's other points that regardless of what it is, quarterback, cornerback, offensive line, offensive tackle, guard, mm -hmm. whatever the case may be, the Raiders have to get it right at 13. Because if they whiff, if they, if let's say they pick a, an offensive tackle and he's not a good offensive tackle, that means your your rookie quarterback or whoever is that quarterback, Aiden O'Connell, Gardner Minshew, could struggle. Now we got Colton Miller on the left side. A lot of people seem to forget Colton Miller was a pretty good pick on the offensive line. They seem to remember Alex Leatherwood, and they forget Colt Miller was a pretty good offensive. Not, not yeah. you, Tarek, but a lot of people say, well, the Raiders whip on the, all these offensive linemen, all these offensive tackles. Hey, they, Gruden, Gruden and uh, McKenzie got the Colt Miller pick right. So yeah. there's some hope there. I uh, know Gruden's not the with the regime anymore, and McKenzie has moved on. But as I said, Tom Telesco has a pretty good history in the early rounds of his guys playing right away and being impact players. And he talked about that with JT DeBrick, of getting an impact player in round one. I think he will because, if we, as we talked about today in the first segment, there are a handful of offensive tackles that we both think could be week one stars. And I oh, think yeah. the Rays will get one of them if they don't choose a quarterback. Yeah, I mean, I, listen, I, I I would go as deep as the sixth best offensive tackle yeah. in this year's draft could be a, it will be will be a starter in the nfl yeah. so good stuff Tarek. always good by the way if you want to be part of the show 702-900-7869 sorry 702-900-7869 you can leave your voicemail leave your name where you're from and your question so we appreciate that very much and you know the 13 pick you're right and Tarek's right gotta mm -hmm. nail that pick 
But I also, the caveat is if you go quarterback, you know, every, mm -hmm. it's more of a crapshoot, right? But I think yeah. to me, I still, and maybe, maybe I've gotten taken in by the, uh, the excitement, Mo. At 13, I, I, I just have the sneaking suspicion that if, if Penix is there, they take him. So even though the offensive line need is there, and then if I'm them, I'm trying to trade up from 44 in the second round so I can get a, the best offensive lineman I can get. So we'll see. But that's just conventional thinking. It depends on the week and which way the wind's blowing. So there you go. All right, Tarek, thanks again. All right, our last call of the day. I told you people were shy this week. We only had two calls. We had the one email. If I missed your email for some reason, it got stuck in spam. I haven't seen it, so I apologize. Please do. Of course, we're going out to Fresno with Jacob. So hold on to your hats. Yep. Gully, 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 grunting. And many, 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 ten, boom. Okay. This is Jacob from Fresno. What's up, guys? How you doing? Good. Fantastic. Fantastic. Fantastic week. Fantastic day for moi. I am one sleepy guy, but I got to make a call before it's time, so I'm making it. <laughs> Listen, guys, I know I've been so high on Jaden Daniels, but let's take a step back. Did you see that picture of the pointy elbow? We can't have a pointy <laughs> elbow quarterback, right? At least that's what the ex is telling me. That's what all the social medias are saying. Oh, look at Jaden Daniels' big pointy elbow. Guys, there's a problem with the picture. It's not real. Look at it. His doggone forearm is coming out of his bicep. It doesn't make sense. <laughs> Something's wrong. The file was corrupted. I don't know. That picture is not real. That's all I know. The picture was real. There was some sort of glitch. But come on. Can I get some input on the Jaden Daniels? Am I alone here looking at that picture saying, golly, it's not humanly possible. Stop complaining. He's a Heisman Trophy winning quarterback. He's a dog, as one Pat McAfee might say. The guy needs to be a Raider. Let's go and get him. That's all I got to say about that. Other than that, how you guys doing? Doing pretty good? Good week? Yeah. No uh, questions this week. But uh, I'll give you a little Andrew Dice play if you, if you, uh -oh. if you take him. Bada bing, bada boom. From the womb to the tomb. Hickory, dickory, duck. And I won't finish it because I'm a good godly man. But God bless you guys. Take it easy. Oh. Raiders. There you go. There's Jacob out in the Central Valley in Fresno. I wonder if he was always, dri driving up always, 99. What he's doing. I don't know what he was doing. But. I always love a good Jacob call in the show. Man, it's so funny. Oh, Jacob, you got me. He's great. Good stuff. But the Jane Daniels thing. So obviously a lot of, a lot of Raider fans, Mo. <laughs> Do not want to give up on the Jaden Daniels dream. I'm not telling you to. Mm -hmm. Crazier things have happened. But I look at it now and I, I, I look, Washington, you know, they were early on, it was all Drake May, Washington, Drake May. Now you've heard JJ McCarthy, but mostly you've heard Jaden Daniels. It makes a lot of sense. Listen, the kid is the reigning Heisman Trophy winner. Like the fact that he's not going number one is because he's going against last year's Heisman Trophy winner. Uh, in Caleb, Caleb Williams. So you look at that and, and I, I don't know what the price would be. It would not be much less than Caleb Williams to try to go get Jaden Daniels. It wouldn't be much less because the team that could possibly, the teams that could possibly take them also need a quarterback. Yeah. <laughs> they don't have their guys. I think the Washington commanders have Marcus Mariota in place. And the Patriots have Jacoby Brissett in place. Those guys aren't the franchise guys. So yeah. I, I, you know, I, I think both teams are taking a quarterback. I will comment on on the picture that Jacob was talking about, <laughs> the action figure elbow that was shown in the picture. I, I don't know if it was real or not, but it looked it looked just like if you were a kid playing with action figures and you kind of bend the elbow back. It looked just like that. And I believe yeah. Jane Daniels did comment on it, basically said it was capped and then there's nothing wrong with his elbow. Oh, uh, somebody apparently somebody was trying to impact his draft stock. I wouldn't be surprised if it's a fake picture that a Raider fan put that picture out there and say, see, there's something wrong with Jaden Daniels' Stop. elbow. He needs to drop all the way to 13. And for the people who is. are wondering what it is, I just put it up on the screen if you're watching us on YouTube or X, wherever you're watching us. Mm -hmm. But there's the picture. Yeah, it, 
and actually i've seen worse ones than this some people have bastardized yeah. them even more yeah um yeah. but it's like <laughs> he had to say my elbow's fine it's <laughs> like and, and, and meanwhile like there's somebody named uh anthony pearsoni who sent that picture out on the <laughs> internet <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> I'm just kidding. Coach Writer Burst John <laughs> is the author of that was the author of that doctored photo. Yeah, Raider Tom. Tom T. <laughs> Raider Tom T. Raider Put Tom that photo. <laughs> 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 oh, okay. We're having fun with that now. Uh, but yeah, so so yeah, that's that's but I'm glad Jacob brought it up. It's one of those cool little weird things that we could talk about. So it's all good. All right. Well, if you guys want to be a part of the next show, make sure you call 702-900-7869, 702-900-7869, or you can mail us at mail at silverandblacktoday.com. That's mail at silverandblacktoday.com. Good stuff. And thank you to all the callers for uh, bringing some joy and good questions into our lives. Mo, tell everybody what you got the rest of the week. It's Thursday, so the weekend's coming up on us fast. But what's shaking for Midtown Mo? Well, I've been talking about it all show, the Sports Not piece that I put out on Tom Telesco and his, some of his uh, tendencies, his draft tendencies and patterns that I discovered while looking at 11 years of him as a general manager for the Chargers. That's, up again, on sportsnot.com. Five things I pointed out. Now, again, I'm not guaranteeing these things will happen or that will pan out the way it has in the past. But it's a good, you know, as you said, it's a good uh, breadcrumb trail to, to or clues to see what Tom Telesco might do. I talked about the wide receiver position. I talked about the cornerback position. I talked about what quarterback he may like, though it's a small sample size. I talked about the offensive lineman. A lot in that piece that I discovered mm. over pouring. Maybe I spent two, three hours just looking over Tom Telesco quotes draft uh, draft classes, what those players did, how those players performed, when they started, uh, and and if he kept them around. So take a look at that piece. I, I thought uh, if I want to pat myself on the back, I thought I did a good job <laughs> on it because I spent a lot of time. I spent a lot of time on that piece because it's, again, it's eleven yeah. years of draft classes from Tom Telesco. He has a, he's very experienced GM, and there's a lot to look into there. There is, and and definitely go read that uh, because that that's the point, right? You know, we we read and we peruse stuff very quickly these days. But the one great thing, if you really want to appreciate Mo's work, you need to read the deeper stuff. And he's just talking about that, doing all that research. It's a lot of work. Like people people don't understand the writing sometimes comes easy. It's the research and the organization and and how you kind of set it up that takes a lot of the time. So uh, when you read good stuff, appreciate it. I know dude, cause most of your readers who give you feedback and I'm the same way when I get feedback on the stuff I do, even if it's not Raiders related, um, the stuff that I tend to be really proud of is the stuff that you do that way. You're researching it, you come up with some good points and people recognize it, which is nice. Cause that's what you're doing. We write it for ourselves too, yes. But when the reader gets it and understands it and says, hey, you know what, that was very informative or that was this, that it, it shows that that extra work you put in uh, really matters. So make sure you go check out most piece up on sportsnot.com. All right, my man, we are done for the week. We'll be back early next week. We'll, we'll get two shows in next week. Um, so we'll uh, make sure you call in 702-900-7869. Be a part of Thursday's show next week when we do the mailbag. And we'll wait and see what happens. And we'll see what other draft rumors are coming out. And we'll get into the defense next week. Right, Mo? We're going to look at a little... The Raiders, even though Christian Wilkins is there, even though you got Max Crosby, they still need another interior defensive lineman. And hey, maybe even later in the draft, a project, maybe another edge player. Cornerback first, but we'll we'll get into some defense. We'll go on the defensive line uh, on Tuesday. All right, Mo. Take care, my friend. Take care. All right. For our producer, Mike Robbie, for Mo Moten, I'm Scott Colbrands. And this has been Silver and Black Today, an Odyssey Sports original podcast. We will talk to everybody next week. Bye-bye. All right.